Last time in our study of the book of Luke, we covered Jesus doing a number of things. First of all, giving the parable of the Good Samaritan in response to a scribe questioning the definition of a neighbor. Who is my neighbor? He also was found correcting Martha for putting physical servitude above spiritual priorities. Then we found him giving the outline for prayer, followed by the need for belief and persistence in our prayers, and then correcting the belligerent Pharisees and scribes for attributing his miracles to the power of Satan the devil. And then finally, warning both the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders, as well as the people, of what lay in store for the nation if he was continually and would be continued rejected by them. <clears throat> All right, so we're ready to pick up now in chapter 11, verse 29. And while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. Some of the scribes and Pharisees, back up here in verse uh, 16, had asked for a sign from heaven as proof that Jesus represented the kingdom of God. Luke only records that the sign of Jonah is one thing, whereas the apostle Matthew gives specific details. Luke gives this as a sign, and we'll get to it, but Matthew goes into considerable detail. In fact, let's look at Matthew's account, back in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. Matthew 12, verse 40. Here, Matthew records Jesus as saying, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The actual sign of Jonah, based upon what we read here in Matthew chapter 12, which was to be the proof that Jesus came from God, representing the kingdom of God, would, uh, would be Jesus' resurrection from the dead after being entombed for the exact amount of time that Jonah was inside the great fish, from the time he was swallowed until he was finally spit out of the fish's mouth. Exactly three 24-hour days were to elapse from the time that the body of Jesus Christ would be placed into the tomb, as we know of, jo of Joseph of Arimathea, as the sun set on Wednesday. And then his body would remain there for three 24-hour periods until the moment that he finally walked out of the tomb immediately after the Sabbath ended that particular week. So three days and three nights. That was the sign of Jonah. But note what Luke goes on to tell us here about the sign of Jonah in verse 30. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. Now, Luke doesn't mention anything about three days and three nights. doesn't mention anything about Jonah being in the belly of the great fish. At the time that Luke composed his account, over 20 years had elapsed since the events of Jesus' death, entombment, and resurrection. Clearly, Luke was aware of the connection of the three days and three nights of Jonas's, of Jonas's, or Jonas, Jonas in the, the Greek, but Jonah's experience with the time that Jesus' body was in the tomb. It's very clear. Luke would have known that. Impossible not to have known that. However, it seems that his eyewitness sources had only connected the sign to the appearance of Jonah in the city of Nineveh to deliver a warning and connected that, Jonah's, uh, or Jonah's appearance in Nineveh, to Jesus being present among the Galileans and preaching to them, giving them the gospel, the warning of the coming kingdom of God. And so this is the way Luke's eyewitness sources gave him the material. Now, Luke is simply, remember, compiled. He compiled over time, over probably several years of interviewing witnesses. 
He went out, remember the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that there were up to 500 witnesses that Jesus had been resurrected from the dead. And so Luke went around and compiled material over a considerable amount of time, probably several years, and then he wrote this. But he was, from the, from the very outset of his introduction, he said, I am giving you what I received from eyewitnesses. So in other words, he is relating what he was told. And he's not adding anything to it. He's, just, he's giving us what others had seen. And so this is what came to him. This is what struck the people. And that's what they relayed. That's what he recorded. Now, going on in verse 31. Uh, the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with the, man, the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. Now, unlike Matthew's account, Luke inserted this passage within the context of Jesus' teaching that focused on the prophet Jonah. You go to Matthew's account, he covers Jonah, but then he covers the Queen of Sheba coming to visit Solomon. And so he sticks it here, and there is some logic to why he did that. But the Queen of Sheba, we're told, journeyed a very great distance in order to meet with Solomon and learn directly from his lips the, the wisdom that he had to give, rather than challenging and questioning what she was told by Solomon, she was filled with gratitude. Because she had heard things from him she had never heard before. She had learned things that she could never have put together herself, so she was incredibly grateful for the things that she had been taught. However, Unlike her, the scribes and Pharisees were unteachable. They continually resisted Jesus, and they attempted to find fault with his teaching and with the works that he performed. As, again, we could go back up here to verse 15 of this chapter, and they're attributing his miraculous event, the, the miracles that he did to the power of Satan the devil. Verse 32 goes on here. The men of Nineveh, will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented. And so we see the logic of why Luke put the Queen of Sheba, inserted it here, because she was willing to be taught. Now he combines hearing something and repenting. So he's taking it a step further here. Will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Now, it would be the men of Nineveh, not God, who would condemn that particular generation. When they are raised up in the judgment, and here Jesus is certainly referring to the white throne judgment, they, the Ninevites, uh, the people of Nineveh, will question the hardness of the hearts of the Jews of that generation. They will be astounded that after having witnessed vast numbers, hundreds, thousands of miracles, and hearing instruction directly from the Son of God, that there could be anyone who lived during that period of the first century there in Galilee and Judea who would have doubted and rejected him. How can you doubt? Look at the miracles. He's raised the dead. But they still rejected him. The people of Nineveh, how could this be? People of Nineveh had simply heard the warning preached by Jonah. And from what they had heard, they immediately acted. They had never asked Jonah for a sign from heaven, as did the religious leaders of Jesus. Verse 32 goes on, and indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. Jesus spoke to all the people assembled. Having been God the Word, the God of the Old Testament as we call Him, who had created the heavens and the earth, and who had surrendered His eternal life in order to come into the world as a mortal man, Jesus was, without question, far greater than Jonah, whose very existence would have been impossible had it not been for the Word creating man. Yet, 
even by the works he did during his ministry in the flesh. Jesus was clearly greater than Jonah because in addition to the warnings that he delivered to that generation, he had also preached the good news of the coming kingdom of God and had performed vast numbers of miracles as proof of his divine origin. Now, as we go on in continuing his focus here in the next several verses, that is, the focus on the reaction of that generation to Jesus and his ministry, Luke now records two of Jesus' teachings from the Sermon on the Mount. Both of these teachings refer to light. Okay, it refers to light. The first reference comes from Matthew chapter 5, verse 15. The second from Matthew 6, verses 22 and 23. Now, note verse 33. No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret or a hidden, as several translations have, a hidden place or under a basket but on a lampstand that those who come in may see the light. Now, we note here that Luke omits the context of this teaching. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus included this self-evident statement to emphasize to those who, with whom the new covenant is made that they are to be lights in this world. And they must let their light shine by doing the will of God by performing, keeping the commandments. They were to do all of these things so that the Father in heaven could be glorified. That's what we're told. Matthew chapter 5, beginning about verse 14 through verse 16. Because in verse 17, he says, I haven't come to do away with the law. I've come to magnify it, to make it even, put it on a greater plane, on a spiritual plane. But that was the original context of this statement. Luke places this statement here because he understood it to refer to the light of Jesus' ministry, which was done in full view of all the people. He wasn't trying to hide anything. He was out there performing miracles. People could see what he did. They could watch him. They could see his lips move and hear the words come from directly from his mouth. And so this is how Luke applied what his sources gave him. He puts it here. Going on in verse 34. I'll read from the New American Standard translation. The lamp of your body. Now, a lamp is what? It's a source of light. Okay, The source of light of your body is your eye. That is, that's where the light comes in. That's how we see. Okay. When your eye is clear, or when your eye is good, or healthy, some translations have, your whole body also is full of light. But when it is bad, when the eye is bad, there's something wrong with the eye, when it's unhealthy, as some translations have. Okay, blindness. When you're blind, no light could come in. It's all darkness. Okay, so your whole body is full of light, but when it's bad, when it's not healthy, your body is also full of darkness. Verse 35 from the New Revised Standard, Therefore, consider whether the light in you is not darkness. That is, maybe you're fooling yourselves, maybe you think you have light in yourselves, and that's certainly true of the religious leaders, the scribes and Pharisees. Maybe you think it is, but you really can't see. You're in blindness, but you think you can see. Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, this passage followed the teaching about laying up treasure in heaven. It shows that if our primary goal in life is looking to God, okay, looking to God, doing the will of God, our relationship with God and others will be good. It will be what it should be. However, if our primary focus is being obsessed with pursuing selfish desires, looking away from God, ignoring God's will, we will regress to be in the same condition of darkness from which God has called or drawn us out. And that condition was 
spiritual blindness. Spiritual blindness. We'll go back to that. If we're not looking to God, because God is the source of light. Here, Luke understands this passage that was used in a different context in the Olivet, or rather in the Sermon on the Mount, to reveal the spiritual results of either recognizing or rejecting Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, as he called himself back in John 8, 12. Now, verse 36, the Revised English Bible continues, If you have light for your whole body, with no trace of darkness, that is, you're filled with light, it will, be, it will all be full of light, as when the light of a lamp shines on you. Those who recognize and accept Jesus and the message that he brought will repent and be baptized. That's what we know, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then at the coming of the Holy Spirit, they will have Jesus, the light of the world, filling them with light by his presence in them. Again, we go to Galatians chapter 2, 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. It is Christ who lives in me. So his presence is there. You will be full of light. And that's what, again, Luke is applying that to this. Verse 37. And as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine, or to, Goodspeed has, to lunch with him. So he went in and sat down to eat. Now, Jewish practice at that time was to have two meals a day, the first in late morning and the other after the workday had come to a close. Two different Greek words are used. The one used here is referring to the earlier meal of the day. It's a totally different word when we're looking at the, late, the latter, the one at the end of the day. So, this is sometime around noon, maybe, lunchtime. Verse 38, the Revised English Bible has, the Pharisee noticed with surprise that he, Jesus, had not begun by washing before the meal. Now, unlike Matthew and Mark, Luke does not provide the background of the Pharisaic regulation that required washing hands and arms prior to a meal. We need to go over to, uh, to Mark chapter 7, Mark 7 verse 2. And here we will see what the deal is. Why this Pharisee was upset that Jesus didn't wash. Okay, verse uh, 2, Mark 7, verse 2. Now, when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, or as the complete Jewish Bible has here, in a ceremonial washing, which included going all the way up to the elbows, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. All right, so that's the background of why the Pharisee was upset, or why he was surprised that Jesus would not follow the tradition of the elders. In keeping with the primary theme of this entire section, which uh, began back up here in verse 15, focusing on the, weak, uh, the wickedness and the influence of the religious leaders, Luke, now in verses 39 down to verse uh, 52, has included much of Jesus' condemnation of the scribes and Pharisees that was given in the temple court three days before he was put to death. All right, so this parallels Matthew chapter 23, at least most of it or quite a bit of it. This inclusion was due either, that is at this point, was due either to Luke's sources being confused as to the actual time frame of that event or it's even possible that Jesus could have given a more abbreviated version of Matthew 23 at a different time. Although, I believe they're talking about the same thing. I think this is the same. 
Verse 39, Revised English Bible. But the Lord said to him, You Pharisees, well, again, Pharisees putting him down because he hadn't washed his hands. He hasn't ceremonially gone through and done what the tradition of the elders require. You Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and plate, but inside you are full of. Moffat has, your inner life is filled with greed and wickedness. Jesus uses this example of cleaning dishes to illustrate the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees. They expended a lot of physical effort in order to make themselves appear righteous and godly to everybody else, to the people watching. Oh yes, you know, oh, such an outstanding individual. Even though they were actually ungodly and greedy. That's what their motivation was. They were guilty of inventing and imposing regulations to coerce the people to yield to their authority and to serve them and their needs. That's what the religious leaders were after. Verse 40, good speed goes on. You fools, Jesus called them, did not the creator of the outside make the inside too? Now, remember, the scribes in particular claim to study and teach the Holy Scriptures. So, therefore, they should know how much God stresses the importance of purity of thought. It's all through the Holy Scriptures, especially the Psalms, the purity of thought. It's there. So, if they were experts, why didn't they see that? In Matthew's account, Jesus instructed them to first clean the inside by examining their thoughts, their attitudes, and their motives. Repenting of their sinful practices and then drawing close to God. That's what we find in the parallel back in Matthew 23. Cleansing the heart automatically causes a visible change on the outside. You change the inside, it will be reflected on the outside. That is, in outward conduct. Be a total change in the way we do things. Verse 41, the New Revised Standard has, So, give, alm, give for alms those things that are within, and see everything will be clean for you. This verse parallels Matthew 23, verse 26. Now Matthew 23, 26 admonished the Pharisees to cleanse the inside of the cup and dish that the outside may be clean also. One explanation of for the variance in Matthew's account and what we find here is that the Aramaic words the Aramaic word for give alms and the Aramaic word for cleanse or to clean is very, very, very similar. In fact, they sound a lot alike. And so Luke, remember, was taking notes as he interviewed people over time. And it may be that it may have been a, one of his earlier witnesses, you know, and he's putting notes down. And when he went back to his notes, he may have misheard or whatever, and instead of putting the word for cleanse, he put the word for give alms there in the Aramaic. At any rate, that, that would help make sense, because this makes absolutely no sense. Give alms? You know, in other words, can you buy your way into heaven? Because that's what it sounds like. You give alms, you, you do this, and... You're gonna the, oh you'll be clean the rest of the way. Well, hold it, you can get you can just give money and and be in better stead with God. That makes no sense. So there is a little bit of a slip up here. Whether it was what Luke heard or what the people that came to him and reported to him, his sources told him. Because again, it needs to parallel what we have in Matthew 23. All right, going on in verse 42 in good speed. But alas for you Pharisees, or woe to you Pharisees, the New King James has, 
For you pay tithes on mint, rue, and every tiny herb and disregard justice and the love of God. They were very conscientious in outwardly performing the tithing requirements that are found in the law because they would be seen by others. You know, you didn't write a check back then. You had to go and you had to physically give it at the temple. You know, there were collection places and, and so they would bring it and they could be seen. It's like we read back in Matthew 6 about giving alms and the trumpet. You know, they, there were these gizmos at the temple. You put your, your, your temple tax in or whatever else and it made a noise as the money went down these metal tubes and draws attention. Wow, there were a whole bunch of coins that just went in there. Who did that? Okay, that was what they were after. They wanted to look good before people. Again, they expended no effort, however, in fulfilling the more important requirements of the law that were to spring forth from within, from the heart, which is displaying love for God and love for man. In addition to justice, as Luke records here, Matthew's account has mercy, justice and mercy. And in place of the love of God, Matthew's account simply has faith. Matthew's account that there is justice, mercy, and faith. These are the things. Don't leave the other undone, but these are the things you need to be concentrating on. Verse 42 continues, good speed, but you should have observed these without neglecting the others. You should observe the justice, the mercy, and the faith, or mercy and the love of God. Jesus here confirmed that tithing was required. Hundreds of years prior to instructing the tribes of Israel and about their obligation to give him a tenth of all of their increase, and God spells that out. As God, the Word, and Melchizedek, he hundreds of years prior to that, had accepted tithes from Abraham in Genesis chapter 14 on behalf of the Most High God. Now, that predates Jacob. Well, God, you know, if you'll just get me through this, I'll give you a tenth of everything. You see, there are people who have this concept. Well, Jacob made a vow, and therefore all of his descendants had to fulfill that vow. This goes back to Abraham. It doesn't start at Jacob. Anyway, I, I read some things and people, I don't know why they come up with some of the things they do. Anyway, verse 43, New Revised Standard. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love to have the seat of honor in the synagogues and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. Now, the seat of honor was the seat closest to where the scrolls were kept in the synagogue. And it was reserved, that seat of honor, for the man that was considered the most righteous by that particular synagogue congregation. Verse 44, complete Jewish Bible. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves, which people walk over without knowing it, or without knowing the New Living Translation has, without knowing the corruption they are stepping on. Now the Pharisees and all of the religious leaders and even the people that had been taught by them were very careful to avoid getting anywhere close to a grave for fear of walking over one and becoming ritually defiled. You see, it didn't matter if the person had been buried for a thousand years. If there was a dead body in that ground, somehow it permeated all the way to the top, and if you touched that dirt, you became defiled. That's, that's the teaching. You say you don't want, in fact, uh, as we've covered before, right before, especially the, the spring holy days, before Passover, they would go and they would whitewash the tombs. Any place where there was a grave or a stone, they would take and paint it white so that pilgrims coming in would see, well, i got to get away from there, I can't step on that, because if I touch that ground and walk across it, I won't be able to keep the Passover. Remember, you got to wait. you got to wait days, a week, whatever, to be purified if you've been defiled in order to keep the Passover. 
Second Passover was primarily for those who had been defiled, touching bodies, burying the dead, or whatever. And so, yeah, you want to avoid that. You don't want to touch the, anything that would defile you. And yet, due to the wickedness of the scribes and Pharisees and their moral corruption, they, they were defiling the people which came to them for guidance and teaching. It was like, when they came to him, it was like walking over the grave of a dead person. That's what Jesus compared them to. Verse 45. Then one of the lawyers, or scribes, or experts in the law, different translations have, then one of the scribes answered and said to him, Teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. You are insulting the complete Jewish Bible. You're insulting us also. You're lumping us in with the Pharisees. Well, some of the Pharisees were scribes. But they did catalog themselves a little differently. The scribes, remember, were considered to be authorities uh, on the Holy Scriptures. They were the people that you went to. Oh, those are the professionals. They know the Scriptures. And over the decades, the scribes had been instrumental in helping to formulate many of the rabbinic regulations and traditions that had been imposed on the Jewish people. Because they were the ones who knew the law better. Who did you go to in order to come up with these regulations? Well, we've got to talk to the scribes because they're the ones. They're the experts. They'll know. This scribe, who considered himself to be an important scholar, as they almost all would, did not feel that he and the other scribes deserved the chastisement that Jesus was dispensing at that time. And so we find here that he let Jesus know that he should treat the scribes with respect because we study the law. You know, we should be respected for what we do. All right, verse 46, New Revised Standard. And he, Jesus, said, Woe also to you lawyers! Woe also to you scribes! For you load the people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not lift a finger to ease them. Jesus responded to the scribe by emphasizing that as a group, the scribes deserve no respect because of their unmerciful treatment of the people of God. They required the Jewish community to abide by rabbinic regulations and traditions of the elders, such as prohibiting adult children children from materially helping their needy parents. If those children had dedicated their possessions to the temple due to the persuasion or even the coercion by the scribes and Pharisees, they had been coerced to do it. And because those adult children had been coerced, they, by following this tradition of the elders that the scribes were largely responsible for, those people transgressed the fifth commandment according to what Jesus uh, stated back in uh, Mark chapter 7, where we read a little bit a little, a little earlier. Wicked traditions such as that particular one, created for the benefit of the religious leaders, could have been abolished just as easily as it was instituted. It could be abolished in order to help needy parents, elderly parents, who weren't able to, to do physical labor and do the things to make an income. But the covetousness of the religious leaders guaranteed that such traditions were maintained. Well, you know, it wouldn't be good to lose that because we're going to lose some income. We're not going to be able to, to live a, as high a lifestyle if we cut this one out. So we've got to keep this one. And you know, we've got to keep that inheritance tax. Let's take it away from those people. Verse 47. Things haven't changed. Complete Jewish Bible. Woe to you. You build tombs, or some translations, monuments, in memory of the prophets. The scribes and Pharisees either renovated 
or built new tombs for some of the prophets, and they added monuments over the graves of some of the others. And they did that in order to convince the people that they honored the prophets. They had a lot of respect for the prophets. However, the honor they expressed was all outward show because they did not abide by the admonitions that those prophets had brought from God hundreds of years earlier. They weren't doing what the prophets had said. Even though they were reading it, the scribes, scribes were recording it. They were the ones who were making the scrolls. And they still weren't doing what God told the people to do through the prophets. Verse 47 continues in the complete Jewish Bible. But your fathers, or your ancestors, some translations have, murdered them. Your ancestors murdered them. Thus you testify that you completely approve of what your fathers did. They did the killing, you did the building. They did step one, you did step two. Luke's sources fail to include the denial of the religious leaders that Matthew recorded, uh, Jesus quoting. Jesus quoted the, the, the denial that they had, you know, if we had lived, Jesus said, you say that if you had lived at the time when our ancestors killed the prophets, well, we would not have participated in that. We wouldn't have been anywhere close to doing what they had done. They denied that they would. That denial revealed, according to Matthew's account, that they acknowledged their link to the individuals who killed the prophets. Jesus here shows that their connection was more than simply physical descent. You're connected, you're linked not just by physical descent, but you are connected because you possess the same mindset. You possess the same level of hatred to God's prophets as your ancestors did. Been no change in the mindset. You still don't want to do what God told the people years ago to do through the prophets. Verse 49, New Living, Tran New Living Translation. This is what God, in his wisdom, said about you. I will send prophets and apostles to them, but they will kill some and persecute the others. Now, you can search from Genesis 1 through the book of Revelation, and you will not find this quote that God made as it stands here. This is another example of how the events that followed a specific incident affected the memory of Luke's sources about after about 20 years. A lot of time had gone by. Things had occurred. Now, you know, whatever occurs affects our thinking, affects how we remember things. In Matthew's account, Jesus' statement is, his actual statement is recorded. Okay, Matthew 23, let's note this, verse 34. Note the actual statement that was made. Because Luke is recording an eyewitness of what was said. Matthew 23, 34, Jesus said, Therefore, indeed, I, note this, I send you prophets, wise men and scribes, that is, experts in the law the Holy Scriptures, which of course would be his disciples, especially the apostles. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Now that's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I'm going to sin. Now, we go back to Luke chapter 11, verse 49. This is what God in his wisdom said about you. I will sin. All right, please notice. After his resurrection, Jesus was verbally recognized as my Lord and my God. Remember Thomas? After he checked aside, looked at his hands, my Lord and my God. Thomas no longer doubted. He's his God. 
That recognition that Jesus was God spread throughout the church from its founding. Thus, Luke's sources for this passage referred to Jesus as God. Because that's what, at, at the time they were interviewed, it was God. It was God who said that. In like manner, due to years of work performed by the apostles and the murder of the apostle James prior to Luke's interviewing his eyewitnesses, those sources also altered Jesus' statement by dropping wise men and scribes and substituting apostles. Because Luke says, I will send prophets and apostles to them. Matthew said, I will send prophets, wise men, and scribes to them. Okay, so now they understood what it meant when he said, I'm going to send this. He did send prophets. He did send apostles. And that's, again, what the, the mindset of the eyewitnesses, they're relating what they, what's, what's been affected by the passage of time. Now, just as their ancestors had rejected and killed the prophets because they hated the message that the prophets delivered from God, so the current religious leaders would reject, and they too would be responsible for the deaths of men who would be sent in their time. Men like the Apostle James, who was beheaded. Now, why was James beheaded? Go back to Acts chapter 12. He was beheaded because Herod, Antipas, Herod thought it would please the Jews. And when the religious leaders were all happy about James being put to he grabbed Peter and was going to kill him too because it's going to make the Jewish religious leaders happy. He was ingratiating himself with the leaders of the Jews. And so they are responsible. Had they not pushed, had they not done what they had done, against the, the apostles, James would not have been martyred. He wouldn't have been beheaded by Herod. So again, the fault, the condemnation, goes back to the religious leaders. And of course we have Stephen. Stephen, you go back and read Stephen, and what he said there in Acts 8, he spoke in the manner of a prophet, not a deacon. He wasn't serving as you know, the physical duties of a deacon at that time. He was speaking as a prophet. Much of what he said, he was quoting prophets. And so, I will send prophets and apostles, and some you will kill. And that is exactly what happened. Now, we move on to chapter 11, verse 50. The New Revised Standard has. <clears throat> so that this generation may be charged with, or will have to answer for, or will be held responsible for, different translations, the blood of all the prophets shed. Because there had been no change in the hearts of the current generation from that of the past generations who had refused to heed the messages and warnings that God had sent to them through the prophets, the disobedient in the current generation, the generation at that time, shared the guilt of their ancestors, and they would suffer for that guilt. This generation will be charged with, they'll have to answer for, they'll be held responsible for. All the blood of the, of the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world. Now the term, the foundation of the world, we've covered many times, is translated from the Greek katabale cosmos. Katabale cosmos, which refers to the casting down or disruption of the order or arrangement that God initially established back in the Garden of Eden. And what kind of an arrangement was that? Man had a direct relationship with God, had access to the tree of life. Man walked with God, literally. There was no sin. That was the establishment then. This event, this foundation of the world, occurred when Adam chose to disobey God and, by doing so, sinned, which resulted in man being denied the privilege of having access to the tree of life and necessitated the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. Revelation 13.8, shed from the foundation of the world. 
in order to pay the penalty for that sin of Adam and all of the subsequent sins of mankind. Going on in verse 51, the blood of all the prophets shed from the blood. Now, the New Living Translation inserts the murder, because that's what it was. The murder of Abel. From the blood or the murder of Abel, beginning there. Now, all that has been recorded concerning the life of Abel, go back and read throughout the Bible, all that can be recorded concerning his life was the sacrifice that he offered in response to being personally convicted of sin by his faith. That's back in Genesis chapter 4, 4. We can connect that to Hebrews chapter 11 and we get the picture. His offering, the offering of Abel, was a proclamation. Just like a prophet would proclaim something. It was a proclamation that there is the need for blood to be shed on behalf of all mankind so that their sins could be forgiven and the penalty of eternal death could be eradicated, could be removed. Abel is considered a prophet, not just a prophet, but the first prophet, because of his example of faith that continues to point to the need for repentance of sins by turning to God and obeying Him. Again, that's brought out in Hebrews 11. Abel was born shortly after the foundation of the world, that is, after the disruption of the sinless state of humanity, and hence again, was the first prophet. So, from the murder of Abel to the murder, the blood, or again, New Living Translation, the murder of Zechariah, who perished or was killed, complete Jewish Bible, between the altar and the temple. This Zechariah was the one mentioned in 2 Chronicles 24. 2 Chronicles chapter 24 and verse 20. Then the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada the priest, who stood above the people and said to them, Thus says God, Why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, He also has forsaken you. So they conspired, that is, the people conspired against him. And at the commandment of the king, they stoned him with stones in the court of the house of the Lord. Right there in front of the temple. Verse 22, New American Standard goes on. Thus Joash the king did not remember the kindness which his father Jehoiada had shown him, but murdered his son. And as he died, that is, as Zechariah died, he said, May the Lord see and avenge. Zechariah is referred to as the son of Jehoiada, uh, the priest, here in verse 20. However, since Jehoiada had died several years earlier at the age of 130, that's what's brought out here in verse 15, this Zechariah could have been the grandson, or the great-grandson of Jehoiada. It didn't have to be his son, literally, since in genealogical records in the scriptures, son, son can also refer to either a descendant, any descendant, or an adopted son. You find a number of adopted sons that are children that are considered sons in the genealogical records. In Matthew's account, Jesus identified this Zechariah as the son of Berechiah. Now, that's confused some people, and you know, commentators go crazy over some of this stuff. But Berechiah was also the name of the father of the Zechariah who prophesied at the same time as Haggai, you know, which was some 270 to 300 years later. So it's definitely not the same Zechariah that we call a minor prophet. This is a different prophet. Now, Jesus used the phrase back here, from the blood of Abel, or the murder of Abel, to the blood or the murder of Zechariah, to indicate that the, the Jewish religious leaders were accomplices in the deaths of all the prophets of God who had been murdered by their ancestors. Beginning with Abel, which is in the first book of the Torah, 
in the first scroll, he's the first one that's mentioned who was murdered. And it ends with Zechariah, who was the final named prophet that was put to death in the last of the scrolls, which was the scroll of Chronicles that was written by Ezra, Ezra the scribe. So that's why you have Abel and Zechariah mentioned here. Now, verse 51 of chapter 11. Yes, I say to you, latter part of verse 51, yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. So he repeats what he said earlier. In addition to their refusal to heed the warnings of the prophets of God that had been recorded in the Holy Scriptures, the scribes and Pharisees, along with all who yielded to their influence and rejected Jesus, would become accomplices with their murderous ancestors when they conspired to kill Jesus and other servants of God in their time, such as Stephen, such as James, and so forth and so on. For their obstinate, unrepentant state of mind and their rebellious conduct toward God, they would be severely punished. Forty years after the Jewish religious leaders succeeded in having Jesus put to death, murdered by the Romans, in A.D. 70, the Romans would be the tool used by God to destroy the temple and to bring down the city of Jerusalem. That generation it was considered a 40-year generation, basically. Verse 52, Woe to you lawyers or scribes or experts in the law. Again, different translations. For you have taken away the key of knowledge. Or as Goodspeed has, you have taken away the key to the door of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who were entering in you hindered, or good speed has, <clears throat> and have kept out those who tried to enter. There were those who were drawn, but you made sure they didn't go into the door. By claiming to be servants of God, possessing the authority of God, while teaching false doctrines by their traditions and living contrary to God's way, they had prevented those who looked to them for spiritual guidance from opening and entering the door that would give them access to the knowledge required for salvation. That's what he's talking about. They turned, the religious leaders turned the people away from Jesus, who is... The door to salvation. That's what he said back in John chapter 10, verse 9. I am the door, he said. All who enter in by me will receive salvation. And so the religious leaders, oh, he, his power is from Satan, the devil, from Beelzebub. You don't want anything to do with him. Even though the people were drawn to the message, they turned them away. They could not go through that door. Verse 53, and as he said these things to them, or the New Revised Standard, other translations, when he went outside, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him. Or the New American Standard has that the scribes and Pharisees began to be very hostile and to question him closely about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. Now even though, you go back and read Matthew chapter 23, even though Matthew does not address the reaction of the scribes and Pharisees after Jesus finished addressing the crowd in the temple court that three days, you know, some, sometime on Sunday, three days before he was put to death, doesn't, not a word said about the reaction. But when we go back and read 23, you know there was a reaction. This passage is very likely that reaction. And later on that evening, they finally got somebody who delivered him up. His name was Judas. He went to them that night, and they were anxious to take advantage of what Judas 
was willing to do. They were infuriated over the scathing condemnation he had directed toward them. With all these people around, their hatred for Jesus exploded, and now more than ever, they wanted to destroy him. Not only in the eyes of the people, they wanted to destroy him literally. Okay, chapter 12 then, verse 1. In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people, or the Revised English Bible has, a crowd of many thousands had gathered together, so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. He's still on the theme of, you know, the religious leaders. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now Matthew's account, back in Matthew chapter uh, 16, also included the leaven of the Sadducees. Beware of the, the leaven of the, scra of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Which was followed then, once he told them that, the disciples remember that. Uh, now, what did he mean? Did we forget to bring bread? Remember, they were all confused about this leaven stuff. They were thinking, whoa, we, he, he expected us to bring more bread. And, and so they didn't know what. And then finally, he told them, I'm talking about the religious leaders. I'm talking about the way they do things. Just as physical leavening influences the growth of a bowl of dough through a very slow, gradual process, which eventually permeates the whole lump that's in the bowl, so the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees were influencing the people's view of God and how God should be worshipped. Jesus pointed out that all who falsely claim to be following the true God, yet at the same time attempt to convince everyone that they really are following God by deliberately projecting a facade of obedience are insincere and guilty of practicing hypocrisy. A facade is hypocrisy. There are people who put a cloak around them, and that cloak is supposed to, is what you see. It's the outward. But what's on the inside, again, it's like what we read earlier. It's filthy. It's corruption. Because the heart's not right. The motivation is wrong. Verse 2. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known or become known. In Matthew's account, Jesus used this statement to reassure the twelve that despite all of the opposition that they would encounter when fulfilling the commissions that he had given them, the truth that they distributed would be revealed no matter what men may try to do in order to suppress that truth. So don't worry about it. You just do it and nothing can suppress it. Here, Luke has taken it out of that context and Luke has applied that same statement to the futility of of hypocrisy. Even though men can be deceived by the facades of hypocrites, God sees all. And God, being all-powerful, will make certain that all facades will eventually be torn down and everyone will see it for what it is. Now, what he says here is certainly true about hypocrisy. But it's in a totally different context than what we find back in Matthew's account. Verse 3, Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark, notice whatever you have spoken in the dark, will be heard in the light, and what you have spoken in the ear in inner rooms, or the New Revised Standard, what, what you have whispered behind closed doors, will be proclaimed, on the housetops. Now, Luke's sources have again, again, because of their memory, no doubt, have altered the thrust of what was originally stated. In Matthew's account, Jesus told the twelve that 
that they would be required to openly proclaim all of the teachings that he had privately instructed them. He's the one that spoke in secret. You see that back in Matthew 10.29, or 10.27. He spoke. Luke, here, continues to address the futility of hypocrisy. Nothing can be hidden from God. So be diligent to always speak the truth. Now, it fits, it works, it's truth. But again, it's in a different context. Now, what follows in uh, verses 4 through 9 clearly shows that Luke's sources for this material reported on Jesus' teaching that was given on the same occasion as back in Matthew's account in chapter 10 of Matthew, uh, basically between verses 28 and 33 of Matthew 10. All right, so verse 4 here. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. Matthew's account of the final part of this particular statement is more detailed. Matthew has, but cannot kill the soul. Not that they have no more that they can do, but they cannot kill the soul. Now the soul, back in Matthew, is from the Greek word suka. Suka, which refers to self-conscious life. You know, the soul is talking about every soul, every body, every life. A lot of times it's translated that way. It's talking about self-conscious life, which is made possible, as we've covered before many times, by the presence of the spirit in man, which without the spirit in man, Paul tells us back in 1 Corinthians 2.11, uh, you know, sets us apart from the animals, makes it possible for us to, to think and to reason and to do things that way beyond what animals can do. It's the spirit in man. Since retained memory and character, character, of course, is produced by the mind being transformed through the power of God's spirit throughout the course of one's lifetime, but since retained memory and character are recorded within the spirit in man, which the Father retrieves and preserves upon death at the, uh, that is the death of the body, the soul, which represents the whole person, as we find in other places in the New Testament, soul cannot be destroyed through physical death. You can't destroy the sukkah through physical death because the spirit in man is part of that. It's retaining. It's a spirit. It can't be destroyed by, by that kind of death. Now, spirit can be destroyed, we know, because Satan and the demons will be destroyed according to what the Scripture shows. But the spirit in man, it will go right through death. Consciousness ceases, but everything is preserved. Jesus reminded his disciples here not to be afraid of what men may do to them, for men are limited. They're limited at putting an end to consciousness and the activity of the physical body only. That's all they can do. Since God promises to restore conscious life through a resurrection, there's no need to fear men. Yes, I'm not looking forward to being killed by some guy, but that's not all there is. This isn't all there is. Verse 5. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has power to cast into hell, or Gehenna, Moffat has. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Once again, Matthew gives more detail than Luke does here. Matthew states, Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Whereas men can only temporarily end consciousness by killing the physical body, God can destroy not only the physical body, but also the essence of the spirit in man, thereby destroying any possible soul from existing. 
making resurrection impossible and permanently ending life. No way it can ever be reassembled. It's all gone. Verse 6. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Now, Matthew has in place of five for two, we have two sparrows sold for a copper coin. So a little difference here, but the point remains the same. The point is the same. Just as God is aware of the life of every bird, so he is aware of every detail in the lives of his elect. Every detail. The disciples of Jesus never have to fear. They're never alone. God is always aware of every one of them. And whatever circumstances or trials may be confronting them. He knows. He's aware of it all. In fact, in verse 7, But the very hairs of your head are all numbered, or all counted. All the hairs? Now this is not an annual inventory that God does. He's talking about every minute of every day. God knows. He is aware of everything. Oh, how can that be possible? How can I plug in to Google a word or a question and get a response that's gone through billions, maybe, you know, tetratrillions, quadrillions, you know, to the tenth power and whatever. How in the world can in a matter of seconds all of that come? Man created that. That is squat. That's nothing compared to the mind of God. But he does. Otherwise he's lying and God does not lie. He knows at every point of every second, millisecond, what's going on with his kids. What's going on with mankind. He knows that. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value, or you are much more important than many sparrows. God's attention is always on his elect. He's even aware of the constantly changing number of hairs on their heads. He knows everything about us. Let's go back to Psalm 139. Because he is aware of every thought. Jesus reminds his disciples back here in chapter 11, or chapter 12, that God is aware of all that takes place in his creation, especially in the lives of those that he has selected for judgment during this first day of judgment for salvation. This awareness of how much God knew, David understood. David, way back when, way back before Google, understood it all. Note here in verse 1 of Psalm 139, for the chief musician a psalm of David so this is David now I'm gonna read the rest of uh, this section here uh, beginning in verse 1 uh, through the New Living Tra- from the New Living Translation David states O Lord you have examined my heart and know everything about me you know when I sit down or stand up you know my thoughts and even when I'm far away you see me when I travel and when I rest at home You know everything I do. You know what I am going to say even before I say it. Because God reads the mind. He knows the thoughts. He knows where it's going. Even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Too great for me to understand. It's like, how, how can it be? But it is. It just is. God knows all. We are never, we are never alone. So don't ever think that somehow we can sin and God's not going to know. David certainly found that out. All right, back in chapter 12 again. And verse 8. The complete Jewish Bible has, Moreover, I tell you, Whoever acknowledges me or confesses me in the presence of others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge in the presence of God's angels. Now in both this verse and in the following verse, Matthew records Jesus stressing that events in heaven will be in the presence of the Father. He doesn't mention the angels. Luke's sources 
say the angels, but, you know, Jesus could have said, between, before the Father and all of the holy angels, because it's hard not to have the angels around. According to Revelation 4, God's here on his throne, and we've got, Myriads of angels all around the throne. So yes, it will be in the presence of both. But again, there's a little difference in what Luke records and what Matthew does. Now, having addressed the importance of his disciples, not fearing men, and keeping in mind the vigilant concern that God has for every one of his elect, Jesus now stresses here the need for his servants to acknowledge him before other people. Now that doesn't mean we go to the store and, uh, could I, would you turn away from looking at the Tide detergent? I need to tell you about Jesus. That is not what that means. Okay? That is not what that means. That acknowledgement requires yielding to the guidance of the power of God's Spirit and copying the perfect example of Jesus Christ. Actions have far greater impact than words. Those who wholeheartedly follow His example, that is an example that was perfect obedience to the law, by their actions acknowledge in the presence of others that they believe that Jesus is the Savior who has been sent by the Father. That's the acknowledgement that we're supposed to, to show. And it can only happen by not being hypocritical, not by saying, oh, I, you know, I'm this way and you're not really. Okay, so he's still dealing a little bit with hypocrisy. You're going on in verse 9. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Denial of Jesus involves refusing to allow him to live his life in us. Getting back to Galatians 2.20. He is to live in us. But if we refuse him, then we're denying him. Failing to surrender to him makes it impossible for others to see his presence in us. So we're not acknowledging him. Our acknowledgement or our confession of Jesus as Savior encompasses the entirety of the way of life that we live in the presence of others. Note, Titus chapter 1, verse 16. Here the Apostle Paul makes reference to this. Titus 1, verse 16. It says, They profess to know God, but in works they deny him. They're hypocrites. By works they deny him. Being abominable, disobedient, and, complete Jewish Bible goes on, unfit to do anything good. So professing God and not, not doing what God says is denial. That's what we're shown here. Back in chapter 12, verse 10. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Apparently, feeling that this passage is connected to denying Jesus in the previous one, Luke now interjects a teaching that Jesus had given after the Pharisees had accused him of having an unclean spirit and casting out demons through the power of Satan the devil. Back up here in chapter 11, uh, verses 15, 16. All right, that's where it belongs. It, it belongs earlier in what we read. Uh, in Matthew, it's in chapter 12, after verses 24, somewhere between 24 and 30, I think. By their accusation, the Pharisees had slandered and had belittled the power of the Holy Spirit. And that was the Spirit by which Jesus performed His miracles. He cast out demons by the power of His Spirit. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit requires, first of all, recognizing that Spirit then deliberately rejecting its power. Since the only way anyone can be led to repentance, 
according to Romans, is through the activity of the Holy Spirit. If it is totally rejected and despised, repentance is impossible. It's absolutely impossible. And without repentance, forgiveness is impossible, and without forgiveness is nothing but eternal death. That's it. Verse 11. Now, when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, Luke's sources did not provide him all of the details that Jesus presented on this particular occasion. That some of Jesus' disciples would be scourged in the synagogues. They would be brought before governors and kings due to their faithfulness in fulfilling the commissions that Jesus had given them to go out and to preach the gospel of the coming kingdom. And again, that would be done at the highest levels of government, the governments of men. That's what Jesus brought out. Matthew 10, verses 17, 18, 19. You're going to be brought before. Even the Apostle Paul went before who? Went before Nero, apparently. He definitely went before Nero at some point. Whether early on or not, we're still not sure. But he was released for a while, as we covered in our Acts series. Who was the top dog in the world in that day? If you were the emperor of Rome, you couldn't get any higher as far as a governmental official. All right, verse 11 goes on. Do not worry. When they bring you before people, before those who could scourge you or even have you put to death, don't worry about how or what you should answer. Or the New Revised Standard has, don't worry about how you are to defend yourselves or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour. Or as the complete Jewish Bible has, when the time comes, or at that moment, other translations, what you ought to say. Jesus promised his disciples that the appropriate response to any questions that they would be asked would be inspired and guided by the Holy Spirit. So they didn't need to fret. They didn't need, again, don't worry about men. Don't, worry, don't even worry about what you have to say. With, you know, if you let me live in you, Galatians 2.20, if I am living in you and, you're, and God has granted you his spirit, then you, you've got all you need. Just stay close to God. That's the important thing. So that's the good breaking point. That's where we'll stop for the day.